All right, so get this. We're diving deep into the Lizzie Borden case, mm. but, like, you've never heard it before. Yeah, this is going to be a wild one. We're checking out the third victim, a novel by Ricardo D. Rabello. It takes everything you think you know about Lizzie Borden and flips it on its head. So for anyone out there who maybe needs a little refresher on the basics. Oh, yeah. The Lizzie Borden case. It's like Mystery 101. Okay. Back in 1892 in Fall River. Andrew and Abby Borden brutally murdered in their own home. Your daughter, Lizzie, prime suspect. But she was acquitted. And to this day, the case is unsolved. Exactly. Total mystery, which is probably why it's so fascinating. And ripe for a reimagining, like in this novel. Instead of just focusing on did she or didn't she, Rebello introduces a whole new element. A third victim. You got it. And that's where our protagonist, Emily Greaves, comes in. A writer drawn to the infamous Borden house looking for inspiration. But she gets way more than she bargained for right from the start. Oh, yeah. Rebello really sets the stage for something spooky. The house itself is like a character. This imposing, almost suffocating presence. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Classic haunted house vibes, you know. Locked basement door, strange whispers at night. Even cryptic messages on her laptop. It's like he's using all the best horror tropes to keep you hooked. Oh, absolutely. But then things take a sharp turn with the discovery of a hidden diary. Hidden diary. Okay, now you've got my attention. This is where things get juicy. So what's in the diary? Well, it belonged to Bridget Sullivan. Wait, the maid who was there during the murders. A one and only. And she wrote about what happened. The entries are from 1892 after the murders. Oh, wow. So we're getting a firsthand account from someone who was right there in the middle of it all. Exactly. And Bridget's entries are chilling. What does she say? She writes about a terrible secret. A secret. Something buried. And mm -hmm. she mentions how she knows but doesn't say who she is. Okay, now I need to know more. Right. And as if that wasn't enough, Emily finds something else with the diary. Don't tell me another clue. It's a faded photograph of a young girl who looks a lot like Lizzie Borden. Hold on, a secret sister. That's what the novel throws at us. It's getting good. The possibility that Lizzie had a half-sister named Margaret. And this Margaret, she's the third victim. It sure seems that way, but we've got a lot more deep diving to do to find out for sure. Okay, so Emily's on the case now trying to piece together Margaret's story. She dives into Andrew Borden's past, old records, genealogy websites. Anything she can get her hands on. And what's cool is that Orbello has Emily using real research methods. So it's fiction, but grounded in reality. Exactly. It adds this layer of authenticity to the story. Making it even creepier. As Emily goes deeper, Margaret starts appearing as a ghost. No way the whispers get louder. The house itself seems to react to her. Okay, that is officially terrifying. It makes you wonder, is the house actually haunted or is it all in Emily's head? Right, like is it the mystery getting to her or is something supernatural really going on? That's the brilliance of this novel, it keeps you guessing. And then Emily does the one thing you're not supposed to do in a haunted house. She goes down to the basement. The locked basement door. The one she's been drawn to from the beginning. And that's where she finds. Margaret's remains. Oh, wow. This just took a dark turn. And right next to the bones, a locket. What was in the locket? Something that directly links Margaret to Andrew Borden. So now it's not just a haunting. We've got a family secret. A secret that's been buried for over a century. Okay, we know Margaret existed and something terrible happened to her. Mm. But what about Lizzie? Where does she fit into all of this? We're getting there, but we need to uncover more of the story first. Right. I'm hooked. Lead the way. I'm ready to dive deeper into this mystery. So we've got this hidden family dynamic right out in the open. Andrew Borden favoring his illegitimate daughter. Margaret over Lizzie. I bet that didn't go over well. No, especially back then. Late 19th century, super strict social norms. Lizzie's already dealing with a strained relationship with her stepmom. And then this half-sister shows up. And is apparently dad's favorite. Yeah, that's got to create some tension. Jealousy, resentment, a need for control. And those are powerful emotions. Especially when they're bottled up. So Robella's using this fictional situation. To explore what might have been going on in Lizzie's mind. Right, like what could push someone to do something so drastic. And he's playing on the fact that we'll never really know Lizzie's motives. But he gives us a glimpse into those darker impulses. The dark side of family secrets. Okay, so Lizzie might have had reason to be upset, but what about Bridget? The maid. The one who kept the diary. Bridget's in a tough spot. She sees what's happening. She knows something's wrong. But she doesn't really have any power. She's a servant in a wealthy household. 
Back then, that meant keeping your head down. Exactly. Speaking out could have cost her job. Maybe even her safety. So she's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Wanting to help Margaret, but also needing to protect herself. It's a tragic situation all around. And it shows how societal norms can silence people. Even when they know something terrible is happening. Okay, so we've talked about Lizzie and Bridget, but we can't forget about the house. The Borden house? Oh yeah, it's practically a character itself. The way Ribolo describes it. You can almost feel the weight of history pressing down on you. All those secrets hidden in the walls. The creaking floorboards, the dark corners. It's like the house itself is alive. Watching, waiting. And as Emily gets closer to the truth, the line between reality and the supernatural gets blurry. Is the house haunted by Margaret's ghost? Or is it just Emily's imagination running wild? It's that uncertainty that keeps you on the edge of your seat. And then there's the basement. The place where it all comes to a head. Emily confronts Lizzie's ghost. Armed with the truth about Margaret. And that's when things get really intense. It's not just a ghost story anymore. It's about confronting the past, facing those buried secrets. And seeking justice for Margaret. Right. And the axe plays a big role in that confrontation. Yeah. The iconic murder weapon. Okay, now I need to know what happens. So picture this Lizzie's ghost lunges at Emily axe in hand. No way. But then Margaret's ghost appears. Like she's protecting Emily. Exactly. It's this powerful moment of sisterly connection. Even in death. And it gives Emily the strength to fight back. Does she use the axe? She does, but not in the way you might think. I'm so curious. Tell me more. Let's save that for the final part of our deep dive. Okay, you're killing me with suspense. <laughs> okay, so last we left off, things were getting pretty intense down in that basement. Lizzie's ghost. The axe. Margaret's ghost. What happens next? It's like a turning point in the story Emily realizes. He's not alone. Right? Margaret's presence gives her this strength. To stand up to Lizzie. And to the secrets that have been haunting the house for so long. So what'd she do? She uses the axe. Oh, wow. She actually uses it. But it's not about revenge. It's more like... An act of necessity. Breaking free from the past. Exactly. Like she's reclaiming that symbol of violence. And using it to set things right. So with Lizzie's ghost gone, a sense of peace settles over the house. Like the house can finally breathe again. And Margaret's ghost fades as well. So it's a happy ending. In a way, yes, Emily's able to finish her book. The one about the Borden case. Right, and it makes you think about how our own experiences shape the stories we tell. Like how much of Emily's book is fact, Yeah. how much is influenced by what she went through in that house. Exactly, it blurs the lines between truth and fiction. Which is what makes this novel so thought-provoking. It's not just a ghost story, it's a story about history, memory, and the power of the past. Okay, but here's the question I have to ask, even though Lizzie's ghost is gone. Is the house truly at peace? That's the thing. Rebola leaves us with a bit of ambiguity. Like he doesn't outright say. There are these subtle hints that maybe everything isn't totally resolved. Like what? Well, Emily keeps hearing those whispers. Even after she leaves the house. It's as if the story is still haunting her. Okay, that's creepy. And then there's the last line of the book, and she wondered if the story was truly over. Chills. Literally chills. So it leaves you with this lingering feeling of unease. Like, maybe there are still some secrets hidden in those walls. Maybe some stories are never truly finished. And that's the beauty of it. It makes you think. About the things we think we know about the past. And the possibility that there might be more to uncover. More layers to the story. So for everyone listening out there, what's the takeaway here? I'd say it's this. Every story has multiple perspectives. Even ones we think we know really well. There might be hidden narratives, silenced voices waiting to be heard. And it's our job to dig deeper, to listen to those unheard stories. Because you never know what you might find. That's some great advice and a perfect note to end on. Thanks for joining me on this deep dive into the third victim. It's been a pleasure. And for our listeners out there, keep exploring, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep an open mind. You never know what mysteries you might uncover. Until next time, happy diving. <laughs>